I'd like to bring up our first speaker, Dr. Virginia Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee was born in China and moved to London, initially to study piano at the Royal Academy of Music, but realized after a while that her true interest was in science. She obtained a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in biochemistry from the University of London and got her PhD in biochemistry at the University of California, San Francisco. During her postdoctoral training at the University of Utrecht and at Harvard University, she became interested in the brain and specifically in uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, she started her lab here at the Penn School of Medicine while also obtaining a MBA from the Wharton School. Uh, so her work uh, has and continues to be seminal in the understanding of the molecular underpinnings of many of these disorders, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS. Uh, Virginia is also the director of the Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases at uh, Penn and is also the John H. Ware Third Endowed Professor in Alzheimer's Research at Penn. The first thing I want to say is that I am really impressed by the neuroscience graduate group. I have never seen a crowd this large at this auditorium, although I have spoken at this auditorium at least two or three times in the last you know, two or three years that this, this building has, has started and, and um, uh, hosting events and symposiums. And so what I thought I would do today um, is to uh, tell you some really exciting um, recent advances and in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's research. And so as the title of my talk indicate that, um, that I'm going to talk about uh, a common mechanism of, of uh, disease progression. And so already you've had some introduction on these misfolded protein that accumulate in uh, brains of patients with different neurodegenerative diseases. And so I'm really um, particularly like to highlight those um, um, pathology, the misfolded protein, the aggregates, that are found inside neurons and in the cytoplasm of neurons. And so this is tau protein, which is the building block of the pathology called neurofibrillary tangles that are found in Alzheimer's disease patients. And I also would like to focus a second protein because it's also accumulated as intracytoplasmic inclusions. And that is the Lewy bodies, which are comprised of alpha synuclein. And so you can see that they have different shapes. And so that it's found in Parkinson's disease, but in Alzheimer's disease, you can also see an extracell accumulation and called senile plaques that um, Leonardo just pointed out to you um, earlier. So another really interesting observation that was made in the last 20 or 30 years is that as individuals develop Alzheimer's disease as the as disease progresses, and they also increase accumulation of this misfolded protein. And in Alzheimer's disease, as you can see here on top, for tau tangles, for example, you can see that over time and as the disease progress, and there's increasing accumulation of the pathology. And also for alpha synuclein as well. So as the disease progress, you can have more and more pathology. But what is really, really interesting is that there's a pattern of progression. So in other words, that if you have Alzheimer's disease, inevitably, it starts at the same place. It starts in a brain region called the locus cerulis. And then, then it actually moved to, as the arrow showed, to another part of the brain called the transantorhinal cortex. And then it starts spreading to other parts of the brain, like hippocampus, and then eventually, at lay stage of the disease, the whole brain is filled with tangles. And, but at the same time, there are differences between tangles and Lewy bodies. You see here in Lewy bodies, the accumulation, the initial place is in the brainstem, and then it moves up to other parts of the brain. So there's different pattern of spread that is typical for the different disease protein. And so, we would like to somehow understand this process. And so, but in a nutshell, when you look at this, and basically you can actually boil it down to a very simple concept, okay? So you have a six cell that have misfolded tau or misfolded alpha synuclein. And so what happened is that for what I showed you to, to, to manifest itself in terms of increased progression and to different brain parts, what it happens is that the bad protein has to get out of the cell and somehow taken up by the neighboring healthy cell and then corrupt the healthy protein 
into the bad confirmation. Okay? So what we want to do is we to recapitulate this phenomenon in cell model and animal models. So today what I'd like to share with you is some of our efforts in generating animal models of, of Alzheimer's disease, tau protein transmission, and also Parkinson's disease. So starting with um, tau protein. And so, um, so this is what we did was that this is more or less similar to what you had what, what uh, Leonardo showed you. So instead of, of the misfolded protein isolated from brain, we can actually make these pathology, tau pathology, and using um, uh, laboratory reagent, like for example, E. coli can make the protein, and then we can basically trick um, uh, in, 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 in cell-free system, make these amyloid fibro, they're very, very similar to those that you can see in Alzheimer brain. And what we did was that we fractionate, we basically sonicate this material into small bits, and then we inject it into the hippocampus, okay? So the recipient is actually a transgenic mouse. So in other words, that the animal has been engineered to express a lot of the tau protein, and also the tau protein with the mutation. So this animal actually, as they age to over a year of age, they develop pathology. But what we want to test is that can we accelerate that pathology by giving it a little bit of help to so injecting the tau fibro into the brain and then see whether or not over time that the pathology would spread. And so indeed, that's what we saw. It's that you can see on the top here at one month and where we injected the protein and in this neighbor in different region of the hippocampus, you can see that they have pathology. But what really is interesting is that by one month after we injected the, the, the um, uh, uh, synthetic tau fiber into the brain, that you can see, this is where we inject in the red arrow here, and right here. But what we see in the opposite side of the brain, okay, in the opposite side of the brain, we're beginning to see pathology, okay? So the pathology increase over time. At three months, you can see more pathology, and in six months, you can see abundant pathology, and this is the opposite side of the brain. So in other words, that the pathology can travel from one transmit from one region to another, even across the brain. So, and in fact, it even go further than that. So we inject it here, okay? And then we look, and, and, and hippocampus, so we look at really far away in the locus cerealis, and we see pathology. You can see just right here that in this, in the same side we injected the, the tau, you can see that the pathology actually spread to long distance, very far away, and from the site of injection, and also in the opposite side of the brain as, uh, and the locus cerealis as well, although the pathology is not as abundant. And so this is really amazing because we can use this model for, for to test whether or not we can come up with better therapy for Alzheimer's disease. But now what I like to do is to move on to uh, Parkinson's disease. So we, in Parkinson's disease, actually we've done even better than for Alzheimer's disease. So I mentioned that for Alzheimer's disease, we use a mouse that is genetic engineered to make a lot of the tau protein. Here, we just use a regular mouse, okay? What we call a wild type, non-transgenic regular mouse. And already Leonardo showed you that um, one of the symptoms of, of, of one of the, the pathology of Parkinson's disease is the loss of cells that make the substance called dopamine. And so uh, dopamine making cells in the brain actually are brown in color because they make the substance called neuromelanin. And in Parkinson's disease, we know the cells are gone because the color isn't there anymore. So this one signature is loss of those cells. And now the signature of the pathology of Parkinson's disease is that they accumulate this inclusion that I said earlier called Lewy bodies. And so what we want to do is to try to demonstrate the transmission of Lewy body in a mouse that don't overexpress any cell nucleus, just a regular mouse. And also, we want to see whether or not there's any relationship, a cause and effect relationship between the Lewy bodies and also dopaminergic cell degeneration. In other words, that we want to link these two pathology in the same pathway, whether it is cause and consequence. And why do we want to do that? Well, because there's actually no model that can do both, okay? So we can, you, can make, you, can, you can kill dopaminergic cells by giving the, the, a toxin to the animals. Or you can make transgenic mice, which we've done, like the tau mice that I talked to you about, that actually develop Lewy body 
in all parts of the brain, but not in the part of the brain that make the cells that make dopamine. Okay, so that is really a compelling reason to do this experiment and to try to see whether we can link them together. Okay, so what we did was that we injected a little bit of the fibril, just like the one that I showed you earlier. Instead of tau, now we injected synuclein amyloid fibrils, and we injected them into a different part of the brain. In the part of the brain that connect to the cells that make dopamine in the substantia nigra. So we injected them in the dorsal striatum, and then we wait for about a month. And you see now pathology in the site of injection right here in the, in the striatum. And we also, within a month, we already see pathology in the cortex. So cortex is a different part of the brain. So the way it gets there is that because the pathology can spread from one part of the brain to another. And also we showed that it's in even a further part of the brain. So this, you smell and there's a part of the brain that regulates the sense of smell. So it's very far away from the striatum. And yet we see pathology there. So this suggests that the transfer of the pathology is through a synapse or transneuronal spread. And then we also see pathology in the, in the opposite side of the brain at 180 days. So these are 180 days. So later on, six months later, we see the pathology really literally spread to many, many different parts of the brain. And um, here, what we specifically highlight is the fact that we see pathology in cells that make dopamine. So the green color labeled the cells that make dopamine. And the red color are the inclusion, the pathology, the Lewy body. So you can see that the, the cell is both green and, and red, so which means that those are the cells that have both um, an, a Lewy body and they are in the dopaminergic cells. And so you see that here, just to highlight that they do spread over time and to fill up the different parts of the brain. And so what about dopaminergic cells? Do they kill dopaminergic cells with the pathology? And the answer is yes. So we look at the, the, the substantial nigra where these dopaminergic cells are located. And we ask, OK, at one month after we injected the material in the striatum, and dopaminergic cells, as I said, connect and, and, uh, uh, to the striatum, you see that in one month, and you see that there's, the cells are pretty fine. But over time, you see there's progressively loss of dopaminergic cells. And we see the pathology first, and then the cell loss that link the two together, that perhaps then that you know, the Lewy body form, and then the dopaminergic cells die as a consequence of that. So what about the phenotype? So if you want to make a mouse model and you see the pathology, do they have the same movement disorder as you see in Parkinson's disease patient? The answer is yes. You can see here, as the time progressed after we injected the material into the brain, at three months, and particularly six months, you see the mice are not moving so well. This assay basically move, tests the way they can stay on a balance, actually. So, um, and both this is measuring the strength. And you can see now, they're also progressively losing strength in, in their grips. So they have the clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So what we've done in the mouse actually have been reproduced and by others in the mouse and also in other species. So, so this is the rat, just a regular old rat, okay? And they did the same thing. They injected into the, the, the striatum, and then they look over time in the, in the, in the substantial nigra and looking at cells that make, do, make dopamine. You clearly see that there's loss of the, the cells here on the sides where they injected compared to the opposite side. So this can be uh, replicated in the rat. And this now can be also replicated in monkey. So this is non-human primate. And this is um, the other um, study was done in collaboration with, uh, let me go backwards, with uh, Katrina Palmer at Michigan State University. And then um, in the monkey study, we collaborated with Jeff Cordo at Rush University. And so again, the same thing. He injected the material into um, the striatum, and then he was able to see pathology in the striatum, as you can see here, and also pathology in the substantial nigra as well. So this is really a great system to now studying Parkinson's disease pathology and also degeneration of cells that make dopamine. And so what can we do with this? So now we have great model system that really recapitulate or, or model sporadic form of Parkinson's disease. And so how can you, we use these models for drug discovery? So there are multiple ways. So first is that you can block the release of this misfolded protein from the bad cells, from the cell of the sick cell. And then you can also um, block the uptake of, the, of this misfolded fiber into a healthy cell. 
and you can actually prevent this expansion of the seed and corruption of the endogenous protein. And finally, you can promote the degradation of this material. So what I'd like to do, with, to, to do for the rest of the two minutes that I have is to give you some example of blocking the uptake using antibodies. Okay, so the, the whole idea is that would antibody block this whole thing? And so, so what we did was that this is a design of the experiment. So what we did was that we injected the fibrils and then we actually showed that at one week and there's pathology already. So this is an intervention study. So we then injected antibodies into the, the animals and we can show that by the strength, grip strength, the Y-hang test, the animal regained, even at one month, the strength that they had. And we also look at the pathology six months after we um, and injected the fibers. You can see that here there's a reduction of the uh, a loss of the neurons. So in other words, that the neurons are doing um, uh, um, um, much better. And then here, and particularly in the tyrosine hydroxylase, uh, actually the other one is the reduction in pathology. You can see that the less Lewy body um, in, uh, in the brain. But here we can show that there's rescue of dopaminergic cells um, in these animals. So basically, this I don't want to go to this slide. This is just one some way that we try to demonstrate the mechanism of action of the antibody to try to understand how it blocks the pathology and also uh, reverse some of the phenotype that we, that we saw. And so basically what, what we found was that these antibodies actually block the cell-to-cell -cell transmission that I showed you in my early schematic. So basically they block the uptake of the fibrils into um, the neighboring healthy cells. And so we think that um, that treatment and, um, of this sporadic non-transgenic mouse model of Lewy body <laughs> Uh, with this antibody can reduce the formation of the pathology and also emulate uh, neuron loss and motor deficits. And so what I'd like to do is to thank the people who actually did all the work, and particularly the first three on top. So Michio Iba um, is the, was a, uh, she no longer is in the lab, but she did the um, tau transgenic mouse model. And Calvin Luke um, led the um, in vivo and uh, Parkinson's and model development. And Hain Tran um, did the, was the lead author in the immunotherapy uh, project. And then the rest of the people contributed to it in different ways to uh, the, all the projects. And John Trudinowski is my long-term collaborator for all of these projects. And this is my funding support. Thank you for your attention. So I'm curious about, in your opinion, do you think the healthy cell ones that got uptake, those misfolded protein into the cell, can the cell can be reversible to its healthy state or it could just no longer be reversible? We, uh, I think that in the situation, in, in the uh, non-transgenic, um, the, the Parkinson model, and um, I think that they could turn it over. We, we haven't the dopaminergic cells are more sensitive. And the other neurons that develop pathology, they don't necessarily die. And so there may be a mechanism where they can degrade the material. And with transgenesis, what we actually found is that if you turn off the source of the, of the chance gene, then it, it can reduce the pathology. But I think that it's not totally irreversible. The cells can degrade to some extent. But the, the, what is really interesting is that for both tangles and, and Lewy bodies, they really don't kill neurons acutely. And that's something I really want the students to understand. Um, so when you try to develop cell-based model of toxicity and so on, don't go to really try to look at acute death. Because these cells in brain, in human brain, takes a long time to die. You know? So they can live with tangles for a long time. They can live with Lewy bodies for a long time. The, uh, it, with the misfolding the protein, is there some pathologically, something pathologically systematic about it, or is it the brain of school up? So, um, we say that for Parkinson's disease, and, um, you know, the reason why that um, um, that you get movement disorders, that the dopaminergic cells are under a lot of stress themselves, and I think that uh, 
um, Harry Ostrakos, and the next speaker will talk a lot more about oxidative stress. So I think that, you know, so that's topic off, topographical, because that is the most vulnerable region, particularly for environmental toxins and things like that. For Alzheimer's disease, we just simply don't know. I think age is the most important risk factor. And other than that, you know, um, there are a lot of information about diet and exercise and so on. But I think that they're not really, you know, they, they can help you have a healthy lifestyle and that could be good for you. So with mad cow disease, the uptake of the misfolded protein is through, um, I don't know, maybe the blood or the digestive system. So whereas everything that you have described is within the brain itself. So how is the uptake of mis uh, in the misfolded protein in mad cow disease occurring? Yeah, so mad cow disease is a totally different misfolded protein altogether. Okay, so they are infectious particles. I really would like to emphasize that Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, all these neurodegenerative diseases other than prion disease are not infectious. And somehow something trigger in brain and the pathology and then they spread. And whereas prion disease, it's just a totally different ball game. So I, I just, I didn't emphasize this because of the you know, the, the, the short presentation, but they're not the same thing. Are all the misfolded proteins the same or are they all different? Like, they're all different because the proteins have different properties. And, and um, even now when we study, you know, the misfolded transmission of, the, of tau and synuclein, they behave very differently. And even though you look at them under the electron microscope, and they're called amyloid fibers because they have the same physical structure that you can see. But in terms of the biological property, they're very, very different from each so other. You, there's no way to say it's like an amino acid is missing or something. It's all different reasons why they're misfolded. That's right. There are all different reasons why they become misfolded. Thank you. Yes. 